Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Alan Wallace, strategic advisor at the African Climate Foundation. And on behalf of the African Climate Foundation and IntelliDex, a very warm welcome and thank you for joining us at today's webinar on new thinking around scaling just energy transition financing in South Africa. Um, we have a packed schedule today with some fantastic speakers to take us through some of the, the key areas around financing, quantum scale, looking at particularly the social justice aspects. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Salim Fakir, Executive Director at the African Climate Foundation, to, to set the scene. And then we'll hand over to Peter Tad Montalto from IntelliDex, who will provide some background to some of the thinking we've been doing on this work. Um, we'll then hand over to, to Jana van der Venter, who will take us through uh, the first of, of, of two reports that speaks about capital markets, and we'll conclude with Dr. Zohar Khan um, on looking at the social justice aspects. And there'll be plenty of time for questions and comments, but if there are questions, please put them in the chat. But Salim, I hand over to you to set the scene. Thank you, and uh, no load shedding permitted. Uh, um, I just want to say one or two things. Uh, uh, just uh, from the ACF's perspective on the importance of the second report, um, if people have not read the first report, I would really encourage you to do that. Uh, we have uh, formed a partnership with IntelliDex. Uh, we don't often agree on everything, but we feel that uh, putting fresh ideas on the table is uh, always useful. And we think that some of these ideas should be taken seriously and uh, be engaged in a serious way even counted uh, if possible. Uh, but what I think it's important about the, the second report is the uh, recognition I think the report makes that actually the amount that is being specified in the current investment plan in the JetP is way below what is needed as the threshold. I think uh, the, the IntelliDex report and the ACF report basically suggest that we have to, have to look at a figure of about 2.4 uh, trillion uh, as, a, as a starting point, uh, uh, sorry, a 1.8 uh, trillion as a starting point to uh, look at social justice issues on a, on a very long uh, uh, period. Um, the transition is not going to be easy, uh, but the social justice aspects is crucial for the legitimacy and the success of the, the outcome because uh, the report, as the report notes, uh, we can't work on uh, the idea that a continued model of an exclusive type of transition is going to work. There has to be greater inclusivity. This is the whole premise of the just transition. The energy sector is not the only sector that's going to deliver this. We have to take a wider view. And I think the report does that very nicely to try to uh, uh, talk about uh, a transition out of and a transition in. And the transition in is about a more inclusive mod, uh, model. It requires significant discussions and debates about uh, not just the energy sector, but the economic restructuring and the more sustainable uh, outcomes that meet uh, parameters, not only of, in terms of growth, uh, raising income, but also uh, inclusivity, which is the just aspects of it. So I, I do think that there are some really interesting ideas. It does talk about specifically about the role of the private sector, uh, and there are many thoughts about this, both in terms of instruments and uh, mechanisms of transfer, and also vehicles for transfer of uh, uh, delivering social justice outcomes. So I want to hand over to, to the IntelliDex team, uh, particularly Peter uh, from here. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Salim. Uh, so it's been a great um, pleasure to partner with the, uh, the ACF. Uh, on these uh, these series uh, of papers. Um, we're just going to go through uh, with me and the other speakers uh, presentation just to uh, highlight some of the key takeaways uh, of the uh, of the uh, first two reports that we have uh, that we have written. Um, in particular, um, uh, then I will hand over to uh, Jana and then to Zohib uh, to talk specifically uh, more specifically uh, about uh, paper one and paper two. Um, respectively. But just to introduce us, I mean, we work uh, with policymakers, we work with asset managers, the private sector, 
uh, in particular across a whole range of different issues. But really embedded in our business actually is the linkage between policy, um, uh, politics, financing, uh, and uh, and the social economy, which we we lodge very clear, um, uh, closely in our in our uh, business. Uh, and I think that's really why we've been interested in working on this sort of issue with the ACF, uh, is it brings uh, all those issues together uh, in a very uh, crystallized way um, and is bringing up, uh, I think, a lot of very interesting and challenging uh, issues that we really want to highlight uh, that require systemic change. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a second. Um, so we release a variety of reports with different um, uh, different. Clients, we've done a lot of work in the past on, for instance, social impact bonds um, that we've done. We've done a lot of work on ESG uh, in particular uh, and on uh, communities in transition. We did a big review of that uh, as part of the REAP program uh, a few years ago uh, for first round as well. So we've seen this project really as a continuation uh, of that uh, of that kind of work um, that we uh, what we do. This has been our project team. Uh, you'll hear from Jana and Zohib uh, today, and, and Zetu is on the call uh, as well. Um, just to uh, to highlight then a little bit of background uh, around JET. I mean, what really interests us about JET is the scale of it, uh, the sort of 30 year nature of a transition towards net zero, um, the extremely large numbers that we have a really interesting time and challenging time talking to uh, to clients in the private sector and the public sector about how you do six or seven gigawatts of new energy capacity per year is a massive uh, challenge. Uh, the sort of uh, funding numbers around eight and a half trillion uh, rand that's required uh, overall, um, the sheer number of the people involved in the transition. Uh, and you know, these are not normally the conversations that we have with our clients uh, with, in the private sector, with asset managers, with banks, et cetera. Uh, they're not of this scale, they're not of this time period. And this is why we talk and why we wanted to write these reports about much larger systemic change uh, that's required to achieve scalability uh, in financing. And I think uh, what has struck us about a lot of the research and work that has been done so far around uh, around jet financing uh, is, is it's often sort of around experimental ideas on a small scale. Um, it's, uh, it's about uh, thinking about funding for very specific pockets of types of capital. Uh, I mean, there are climate investment funds, for instance, in the private sector. These are generally very small. Uh, they can get involved in some very interesting, very exciting projects. Uh, but really, when we're talking about scaling financing, whether it's for the capital elements uh, around uh, mitigation, uh, like building wind farms, building solar PV plants, or investing in batteries, or whether it's about investing uh, in the scale of the financing required uh, on the social justice elements, that basically won't work. And Yana will talk a bit more about this. Uh, you're going to have to have a much, much broader range uh, of or what we might term sort of boring or vanilla uh, asset managers or bank financing. Uh, involved. And that's really, I think, where uh, South Africa uh, it can be at the forefront globally uh, of this kind of thinking uh, around how you can achieve scale uh, uh, around, jet, uh, around jet financing. We work you know, across, uh, you know, outside of jet as well, across this broad range of, of different uh, types of capital. And I think it's really important to understand that for uh, the just energy transition to be properly financed uh, in all areas, we're going to have to really think about each of these different segments uh, of capital from traditional investing, uh, that's someone buying a unit trust, that's someone uh, investing uh, their retirement uh, funds, uh, all the way through to more innovative forms of market financing around sustainable investing or thematic impact investing uh, through to philanthropy. And in the second report in particular, we talk about how you stitch together uh, these different sorts of capital uh, across the spectrum uh, overall to, to try and deliver some scale uh, for the just uh, energy transition. Uh, and even in the first report as well, I'm thinking much more broadly about also uh, the investments required in, uh, in capital investments for mitigation. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, how some of these broader structures uh, can also be used um, to, uh, to leverage larger, uh, larger volumes uh, of, uh, of financing. Um, the jet issue, though, is so, I think, interesting because and people who've heard my uh, PCC presentation uh, on financing uh, will have seen this, uh, this bridge diagram before, maybe, uh, is that the issue is so complex uh, just on the energy side, this ignoring some of the other issues around uh, transport, et cetera, for the moment, uh, is so complex across such a different range of reform sort of areas that are going on that require financing uh, in different uh, ways. And I think this is uh, 
uh, again, uh, comes out particularly in report number one, uh, the complexity of the, uh, of the backdrop that's required for, for funders really to get comfortable with the just energy transition. Uh, and whether it's around uh, you know, wheeling that's required, uh, whether it's around uh, the decommissioning that comes out of uh, a more liberalized energy industry that is providing more power uh, through private uh, sector contracts or through community provision of power, uh, you're going to get faster decommissioning, that sort of issue. Uh, all of this is interconnected. Uh, and I think what we try and reinforce with uh, the private sector in particular, uh, and where these reports, I think, hopefully, certainly uh, help the debate, uh, is to try and stitch together some of these issues uh, and how it forms uh, a cohesive uh, whole. Um, so we've been thinking a lot uh, you know, with uh, uh, banks, national managers and policymakers about, uh, about funding, uh, about taking this multi-decade view, uh, about the different sorts of financing uh, required. Um, but really where we come out with these three papers then with the ACF is the scale question. And that's what Jana and Zohu are going to be uh, delving into. Uh, the questions that come up when we when we deal with uh, you know individual asset managers and, and banks really is how they fit into a greater whole that's still not really been uh, fully laid out by the government in South Africa um, uh, and it's hard I think for often individual players to get a sense of uh, I think uh, what comes out of paper one in particular where we look at the broad private sector financing in all areas is the challenge that's going to particularly be faced around funding. Uh, and financing social justice projects. That's why we have paper two there to go into that in detail, which they have all uh, will talk to. Uh, and then finally, there's a third paper coming in about six weeks' time, which is that there are a lot of uh, loose ends basically around the role of the state in particular, uh, how the state uh, can act to de risk private sector projects and funding a crowd in private sector financing, uh, and how the state in particular can work uh, and be at the forefront of working to, to lead private sector financing. Uh, in very geographically uh, and climate exposed areas like Mpumalanga uh, in particular, uh, obviously in terms of the transition or more broadly in terms of resilience to climate change, uh, obviously somewhat more broadly uh, in different areas uh, of the country. And they're the, the three papers uh, overall, which we hope uh, are gonna contribute uh, to the debate uh, on these financing uh, issues. I mean, this is not the, you know, the ultimate answer to, uh, to all issues. There's a lot more questions, I think, that come out of our reports. We, we suggest further research uh, in uh, in both of the reports that we've uh, we've uh, published so far, uh, there's a lot of work going on elsewhere. Of course, the PCC in particular is very interested uh, in the question of funding, uh, both linked to the Jet IP, but also uh, more broadly uh, across the whole uh, the whole transition. Um, so I think this is just the, the point of departure, really, as opposed you know, necessarily to be providing all uh, answers to all questions. But I think we certainly highlight, uh, and uh, Jana and Zohar will highlight that there are very particular uh, issues which come out uh, of this um, uh, these first two papers. So with that, I will hand over to um, to Jana. Thanks, Peter. Um, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. My name is Jana van der Venter. I'm a senior researcher. Um, with a focus on impact investing um, at Integidex, and I was part of the project team that did this first report, um, which really focused on financing the just energy transition, and particularly at the capital markets infrastructure and um, the, the hurdles and the barriers that um, stakeholders across the entire funding ecosystem are experiencing to get um, involved in the just energy transition. Um, this is a highly complex and a difficult topic, and it's not something that we will be able to solve overnight. Um, it's so tricky because we require financing at significant scale continually in a way that's never been seen before. And um, to really, you know, to really um, figure out how to best do this is going to require thinking from, from stakeholders across um, the entire financing ecosystem, as well as from regulators, policymakers, the private sector, and not just in, in South Africa, but in emerging markets and economies that need to transition more generally, and as well as globally. So I think um, with that background, just to say that this is a starting point, and, and we think that 
um, these first two papers in particular has only really started to scratch beneath the surface around what is needed to unlock the type of financing at scale that we need for the transition. So the key challenge is not just in terms of how we're gonna deliver large scale new renewable energy infrastructure and associated grid and storage capacity, but it's also to figure out how we're going to do it in a just and equitable way. And this means that we need to ensure that the losers from the transition are appropriately compensated or that they have a fair stake in the success of, and indeed um, the social solutions that are financed. So rather than just trying to address one issue in terms of, of achieving the scale of financing um, for renewable energy and transitioning out of, of dirty um, projects, we also need to address the social justice issue. So this first report really focused on understanding the scale issue and what uh, the blockages are from a financing scaling perspective. And then um, later on, Zoe will really delve into the second report where there was a much more narrow focus on the social justice elements and figuring out how we will be able to fund that. Um, Peter, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, first, what we needed to do is just to understand how we will be defining um, the just energy transition. So what's the criteria that will qualify um, to make sure that, that we meet all, you know, what's the criteria that needs to be met in order to qualify as a just energy transition? So we drew on definitions from the International Labour Organization, um, as well as ESCOM's own view of a just um, energy transition. Also, the Presidential Climate Commission's JET um, framework, which really focuses on the three principles of justice. And based on, on these definitions, uh, we've developed the following five criteria for just energy transition. So firstly, it's, it's um, transitioning from carbon intensive to green um, energy technology. Secondly, we've got, um, it needs to be done in a way that ensures that there is sustained employment opportunities for displaced workers. So that again speaks to not leaving anyone behind. Thirdly, the net effect of the transition interventions need to be at a minimum growth neutral, um, but um, ideally they need to be growth positive. There needs to be sharing of both the risks and the opportunities um, that are, you know, present um, through the transition process over the next three decades. And finally, there needs to be a voice from both community and labor uh, to ensure that the way in which we do the transition, um, that the most vulnerable and exposed uh, do not get left behind. So this, this criteria basically um, gives us a framework that we can use to understand what would qualify as a just energy transition. But we also need to look at um, the financing um, you know, requirements. So what, does, what, what are the requirements that an investment needs to meet in order to qualify as a, a just transition um, investment or funding for the just transition? Um, and we've, um, we've uh, through our research, um, we've come across um, uh, thinking that's been developed by the UK-based Impact Task Force, um, the Impact Investing Institute, they've identified three just transition elements. Um, the first is to advance uh, climate and environmental action. The second element is to improve socioeconomic distribution and equity. And finally, it's to increase community voice. So the thinking from, from the Institute is that all three of these criteria need to be um, met for an investment to, to qualify or all three elements needs to be included. And they are currently developing criteria for investors to support investors in operationalizing um, these three elements. We think that this is the potential to uh, create a best practice internationally and both in the local market as well as international markets, when investors are thinking about doing investing for the just transition, we think that these three elements will be critically important to comply with. So when we started with the research, and Peter, we can move to the next slide, um, we as a team were obviously quite immersed um, in, in desktop research initially before we, we went into the interviewing process. And 
as we went into, into the interview process where we were speaking with um, stakeholders across the entire um, financing market or investment market, we um, interviewed banks, asset managers, um, DFIs, um, foundations. We really made sure that we had a voice from all the different stakeholders that uh, we think are going to be involved in the funding of the Just Transition to get a balanced view on what the main blockages are. And what was really striking as we started the interview process is that there was still a lot of ambiguity around just what the concept of JET is. What is a just energy transition? What, um, what does it mean from a financing perspective? A lot of the thinking uh, that we came across was that when you know when um, investors thought about the just energy transition, their framework of reference was simply the jet IP, the investment plan, which at the time was still being developed by the uh, pres presidential climate finance task team. But beyond that eight and a half billion dollars um, that have been earmarked um, by the jet IP with the the partner organisations. Um, the thinking beyond that was really quite limited, and this is really um, this really highlighted to us that we need to start with the basics. Um, it's really about setting like a strong foundation in terms of having consensus and coherent thinking around what the just energy transition is, what uh, will be required to to achieve a just energy transition, and who are all the different role players and stakeholders that need to get involved um, with the just transition. Another key barrier that, that, we, um, that was raised by, by interviewees is that there wasn't really a strong understanding of what the investment case is for a just energy transition. Um, a lot of the, the type of, of funding or investments that might qualify, you know, for example, renewable energy investments, these would not necessarily tick all the boxes of a just transition if there's no consideration for the social justice elements or aspects. So what's the investment case uh, for, for a just transition is another issue that um, the market is really grappling with. A third and a very um, also almost, ex, you know, without exception, interviewees flagged uh, a lack of bankable projects um, for the just transition. So um, insufficient pipeline is a major issue that's going to have to be overcome uh, if we don't have projects, enough projects to, you know, projects at, at scale. Peter also mentioned earlier, we need between um, seven to eight megawatts a year in new capacity. And uh, this is much, much larger than what the market has been used to in the past couple of years. In all the previous rounds of the renewable energy independent power producers programs and the reprograms, um, we haven't yet achieved that kind of scale. So there's a lot of work to be done in order to make sure that we develop sufficient pipeline uh, so that we can have enough projects to bundle these projects into funds, which in turn gives investors an opportunity to have a well diversified, um, you know, well diversified portfolios that they can invest in, which de-risks the portfolios. And it will also help to resolve um, issues related to, for example, uh, liquidity, uh, which was also raised by a number of, of interviewees. Um, furthermore, there's, there was, a misunderstanding or there was confusion around what the national jet strategy was. So there's been a lot of progress that's been made in the uh, past um, 18 to 24 months in terms of establishing the governance structures that, that is needed uh, from, a, from a national uh, leadership perspective. We've got the PCC and the, the PCFTT, but there's still a gap in terms of how um, you know, South Africa's plans, uh, our government plans to successfully transition over the next 30 years. And this needs to be integrated across all government departments um, from central government right through to municipalities and, and across all the different um, ministries to ensure that there is again, a coherent um, effort and strategy for how um, a just transition is going to be achieved. Other issues that, that were also raised is, um, you know, a, not a clear understanding in terms of 
who in the financing ecosystem needs to do what. Um, there is not necessarily a reluctance to get involved in the just energy transition, but at this point, um, the market is not entirely clear what they need to do in order to, to get involved. And again, um, there's this question around how are we going to achieve the scale that we need um, for financing the just energy transition. So there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done there. Also from a market development perspective, what are the instruments that we need to um, get funding at scale? As Peter mentioned earlier, um, we've got, we see examples of um, very small targeted interventions, but we've yet to see examples of um, projects or financing vehicles that can really be used to unlock the type of scale that we need. One of these, um, one of, or one area where we can potentially get to the point of, of significant scale is through the issuance of uh, green, sustainable and social bonds or sustainability linked loans. But this market is still very uh, nascent in South Africa. And again, uh, while we've seen uh, quite a bit of issuance um, over the, the past couple of years, the market is very underdeveloped. Uh, one of the issues is that we don't have a sovereign curve, a green, a sovereign green curve, which also prevents um, investors from, from adopting these instruments more, more widely and more aggressively. Um, these are the types of instruments that uh, we need way more of so that, that we can ultimately have, for example, funds um, with a bunch of these instruments that can attract institutional investors uh, and offer them a, you know, satisfactory risk adjusted returns. That's ultimately what we need to, to do. Furthermore, um, in the market, in the local market in particular, there's quite a significant skills gap um, in terms of um, unlocking the funding that we need for the just energy transition, both when we look at um, company level in the private sector, but also at, at government level. Another issue that, that was flagged by a number of investors is, and this is a very, very interesting topic that, that we think requires quite a bit more, um, you know, delving into it, a lot of advocacy around it, is that ESG investment practices um, as they are currently um, being done and, and the way that investors are integrating ESG into their decision-making processes, this quite perversely um, tends to have unintended consequences for the very markets and the very organizations that need that funding the most in order to improve their ESG performance. At the moment, um, you know, for example, ESG screening um, and exclusion lists, they tend to have they tend to exclude markets um, like, for example, South Africa, which has got exceptionally high um, has got exceptionally high carbon emissions per capita, much higher than some developed market economies. And this is a factor that prevents investors, especially um, offshore, from investing in South Africa. And there's a lot of thinking and and um, you know rethinking that needs to be done to ensure that the way that ESG is being integrated and the way that that investors, especially in the global north, are expected to um, report on their, their ESG requirements and comply with frameworks and regulations such as the green finance taxonomy, how that might be preventing um, these investors from allocating capital to markets that need to transition. Strategic jet integration um, is another issue that, that we came across. So we mentioned earlier at, at national level, but it's also an issue that we've encountered at, at company level. Um, banks and asset, ma asset managers and institutional investors are still grappling with how they can integrate, um, strategically integrate ESG, um, the just energy transition. At the moment, a lot of the thinking is that uh, jet is an issue that is sort of separate from, um, from their, their core strategies. Uh, we think that, that there's, a, there's a real need for this thinking to, to really change um, in order to, to create an, an awareness around the urgency um, of unlocking financing at scale. We're going to need institutional investors to get involved to a significant um, degree to, 
to reach um, the scale of funding that we need. Product and, and instrument development is another issue um, at the moment. And it, there's a bit of a chicken or an egg scenario type problem here. We don't have sufficient um, project pipeline um, to entice um, the banks as well as um, institutional investors to develop new market products um, that can, can enable larger scale investing um, in, uh, in the just energy transition. Um, and this is something that really needs to be um, resolved. And then finally, another issue is um, around reporting standardization. So reporting on, on climate um, and climate disclosures is a, is a very, tends to be a very onerous and time consuming process. And at this point, we are simply not uh, where we need to be uh, from a reporting standard, standardization perspective. We are seeing some progress being made internationally with the IFRS Foundation that's developing the sustainability um, standards, but that is still a work in progress and it will take time um, before we get to a point where um, those reporting um, metrics have been standardized globally. So these are some of the, the, the barriers that were identified by the market. Um, it, it ranges from quite basic um, in terms of conceptual understanding to relatively complex in terms of what the instruments are that we need to get financing at scale. And I think it's really important just to, to highlight that, that if we look at the, the different, um, the mix of financing that we need, um, Peter, if we can go to the next slide, what's unique about the just energy transition is that um, we really need to get financing from, um, you know, across the entire spectrum of capital. So, from international uh, philanthropy, philanthropies, philanthropic funding, through to domestic DFIs, um, foreign DFIs and multilateral development banks. Uh, domestic banks are gonna have to play a critical role. Private equity has a really important role to play in terms of, of you know, um, taking on additional risk for jet investments. And then once we've, once we've done the, the market and the product development that's needed through leveraging capital from these different institutions, we hope to get to a point where we can really unlock um, larger scale financing from institutional investors, first in the domestic market, and then ultimately also from foreign institutions. Um, in the initial phase up to 2030, uh, the estimate of funding needed for the just transition is around 2.4 trillion rand. And as I said, we require like a really robust mix of different, different types of funding in blended finance structures um, to ensure that, the, um, the, that ultimately um, institutional investors can get the market uh, risk adjusted market returns that they need in order to comply with their fiduciary responsibility. If we look at one of the instruments that can be used, um, if we can go to the next slide, please, Peter. So transition bonds is, is a potential instrument that, that could be really useful for South Africa in its just transition, um, or its just energy transition journey. So these bonds are instruments that are designed for the purpose of supporting um, hard to abate sectors to raise funding for activities, for product development, for um, innovation around new technologies that will support them in their carbon emissions uh, reduction journey. In other words, just to support them to raise the funding that they need to transition from dirty to clean. Now, the key difference between a transition bond and a green bond is that the issuer itself does not need to be classified as green. Uh, neither does the project need to be classified as green. We know that there's a lot of controversy at the moment around um, greenwashing and, and uh, like a harsh clamp down on greenwashing. So transition bonds um, are instruments that, um, that can be used by these hard to abate sectors to raise the financing that they need to transition from dirty to clean. These instruments have not been adopted very widely. Um, there's not, there aren't a lot of, of um, case studies on, on successful transition bonds, but it really is an instrument that um, South Africa 
can can use and can potentially you know set standards for international um, markets as well on on the use of these instruments if we think for example like um, companies like SAS or, or ESCOM um, these are really good examples of organizations that can use these instruments to raise the funding that they need to support their transition journey If we move on to the recommendations from, from the research um, or based on, based on the, the barriers that we um, identified, firstly, there's really a need to just build conceptual consensus around um, debt financing. There is a plethora of stakeholders um, that need to understand the just energy transition, to understand what their roles are, um, to understand what the different components of, of JET is, is and um, to ensure that there's alignment on this between the different sources of capital that needs to get involved. So this is really the very first step um, towards getting South Africa on a path um, towards a, a successful just energy transition. Secondly, we need to develop the investment case for jet financing, and this can be done through targeted interventions and, and um, engagement on a bank by bank basis or an asset manager by asset manager basis. This is not something that will be achieved um, through, you know, large plans, for example, the, the JET IP. It really then really needs to be a much more targeted approach to ensure that all the different stakeholders um, that need to be involved in the just energy transition understands um, how and why um, it is, it's necessary and, and what the investment case is for, for the transition. Thirdly, um, we need concerted effort from government and the private sector and philanthropies to really develop a pipeline of bankable projects. This will be critical to, to unlock, um, you know, to really develop uh, you know, the projects that we need to, to get the, the scale of, of funding for, for the just energy transition. Then from a, a strategic perspective, both at national level and um, at company level, you know, government needs to be more strategic about um, the just energy transition. And this really includes creating implementation capacity um, across the various spheres of government. And then also for, for, for companies, um, and private sector organizations to, to similarly do that. And also for, for development funders to ensure that their mandates um, align with what is required to um, achieve a just energy transition. We've scratched beneath the surface, as I mentioned earlier, of, of the different stakeholders that um, are involved in the funding ecosystem, but a proper mapping exercise is really needed to understand who the different funders are, exactly the, the value of, you know, the value of, of capital or the amount of capital that's available from each one of them. And then also to understand what the best um, mix of funding and the blend of funding is going to be in order to achieve the um, just transition objectives. Um, if we go to the next slide, Peter, um, we also need to design investment instruments that can unlock financing at scale, so um, a need for product development. There's also a, a really important role in terms of supporting um, banks and, and bank financing capacity. So this is a, a market development issue. Um, currently, there are some constraints from banks in terms of their balance sheet exposure to uh, renewable energy projects, and this will have to be changed in order for banks to take on more exposure to, to these, um, these projects and really play uh, a, a key role early on in, in the project phase um, to ultimately you know, finance those projects and then um, move those projects off balance sheets, and, and that's where the institutional investors will come in. Um, we need to build market um, capital market infrastructure, and this this includes having the right um, you know frameworks and and disclosure requirements in place. At the moment, we've got the, the JSE's got climate um, has, has developed climate disclosure requirements as well as uh, listing requirements for uh, transition bonds as well as sustainability uh, bonds and sustainability linked loans, and we think that that you know. Through the development of these instruments, while the intentions are always to, to ensure that um, there's enough, uh, you know, 
that the, the frameworks are sufficiently robust to avoid greenwashing, there's also a need to, to ensure that whatever is being developed can be practically um, used by, by the market. And we feel that, that in some instances, and from the research and the interviews, in some instances, um, this is not necessarily the case at this point. The skills gap needs to be addressed um, with a much more targeted approach. We need quite a bit of advocacy related to rethinking existing ESG integration practices. This is going to be a, this will be, this won't be an easy feat. Um, I think a lot of work needs to be done in terms of, of changing some of the thinking around um, ESG integration and moving from ESG risk management to an ESG additionality perspective where you really focus on how companies are improving their ESG performance and outcomes and the positive impact that they're having um, on, their, on society and the environment, rather than it just being um, a company materiality issue um, that focus, uh, focuses on internal um, risk management um, aspects of, of ESG. And then finally, there's the reporting standardization, which is currently underway with global efforts from the EFRS Foundation. And just a final thought um, before I hand over to Zoeb. Um, as, you, as you've hopefully seen um, through the research, we've uh, identified numerous areas where, where th further research is required to, to really support advocacy and market development efforts to um, help to mobilize private financing at scale. And some of these areas we think are, are really systemically important. And, Prioritizing these areas, um, have, it, it has the potential to make sure that we've got the right building blocks in place um, to, you know, build on for a successful just energy transition over the next three decades. So these three priority areas include identifying where the gaps are in the local e ecosystem to crowd in commercial funders. Secondly, it's um, to really identify perspective that needs to be finally it's to identify what the key areas are for philanthropic funders to provide catalytic capital to um, ensure that we can achieve measurable scalable and replicable impact on um, the just energy transition thank you so much for for your time i will now hand over to my colleague zaheb who will run through the findings from the second paper i was just going to jump in here thank you thank you very much Yana, I just wanted to reinforce some of Yana's points here. Uh, I think there are some key messages. So first of all, you know, we were talking to foreign and local asset managers, foreign and local banks. So the feedback, for instance, about uh, you know lack of understanding, say on some of the conceptual issues uh, of JET, are from the people who need to be doing the financing. Uh, and I think that's a really important issue to hit home. And and uh, you know, I think uh, the feedback we've had of, often on the first report is that people, I think, uh, have a surprise maybe that actually some of the basics here uh, really have not been done yet to achieve scalability. Now, in simplistic terms, you have 30 years of transition, you know, we have time, blah, blah, blah. That, that's not really the case. Uh, you know, um, we need to, you know, get a move on uh, in terms of establishing a lot of the factors that Yana uh, was, uh, was explaining. Uh, I think the other point people often uh, a little bit uh, unclear on is this idea that there isn't a pipeline. People say, aha, but you know, we've seen all this reform from uh, all, saying all these uh, private to PPAs. That's all true, but it's all being financed by banks at the moment, basically. This ecosystem view is not developing where banks, given the delays since bid window four, given the uh, problems around bid window six, the delays on bid window five, et cetera, we're not seeing of that funding being pushed out into a much broader ecosystem into asset managers, into local asset managers, into foreign asset managers at scale. It's happening in select sort of pieces, but not uh, at scale. And I think that's that's really the, the takeaway messages we want to really impart from report one that Yana has laid out is, is, is jumping from where we are now, which is okay for doing you know, a gigawatt or a year or so, but for, to, to meet this much larger hurdle, uh, we're gonna have to be doing things um, uh, a, a bit, a bit differently. Um, but then, no, lots of uh, from report one, uh, lots of further work required, lots of further research, and then particularly further implementation work. And that's where people like the PCC, uh, people like the JSE, 
uh, and National Treasury are going to uh, have very uh, important roles to play. But I will uh, hand over to Zohib now on the second report. Uh, you know, out of the first report, out of discussions um, that uh, Jan was talking about with a lot of asset managers and banks, uh, you know, the, the complexity and the challenges on financing the social justice elements in particular uh, became particularly apparent, and hence we have uh, drilled down on that a lot more in report two. But over to you, Zohib. Thank you. Thank you, Peter and and Jana as well. Um, so I'm I'm Zohib. I'm principal consultant at Intellidex, and I'm based in Sao Paulo, where I'm also a postdoc researcher at the Brazilian Center for Analysis and Planning. And I'll be talking through the second of of our series of three reports. Um, where we investigated how the social um, social justice outcomes in the energy transition might be facilitated with private capital and what needs to be done for that to start happening on a much larger scale than it is now. Um, and the fact that it's not happening is a significant problem, just given um, the scale of, of the need that's approaching us. Um, with climate change adaptation and transitioning into a new energy system, which affects the entire economy. Um, and it's not going to be easy to change the situation and to come to a situation where we've got a diversity of funding sources, funding social justice. But we have tried to bring some new ideas to the issue, and we hope they're useful. Uh, next slide, please. So here, I'll just talk through our conceptual approach to the problem. So I think that the most common way of thinking about energy transitions emphasizes um, economic, technical, and environmental issues. So when we build new energy infrastructure, this is better for the environment, for example. Or um, we often see comparisons of how the cost per unit of electricity generated from renewable infrastructure is now so much lower than it is with coal. Um, and so environmental benefits and low cost production that promotes economic growth are then assumed to be good for everyone in the same way that we tend to look at GDP growth as automatically good for everyone. But I think this approach can, can neglect the more um, nuanced thinking about distributional issues that's required to address social justice concerns. Where social justice is thought about in energy transitions. It's conceived of as being achieved when, um, when the losers in the process of transition are compensated. So we know that, for example, hundreds of thousands of livelihoods depend on um, coal mining generation and then the value chain associated with that. Um, so social justice thinking is then how do we ensure that these people are not left behind? And so this is the dominant interpretation of social justice in the JET IP. Um, but we argue for a broader approach. So how can we build a new green economy that's more inclusive? And this goes beyond just compensation of, of, of people that lose out in short term while leaving broader economic structures unchanged. So instead, how can livelihoods be supported sustainably into the longer term? Um, and then in areas without any history of coal mining or so you know, coal generation, um, where we're building new generation capacity, how can these new industries be more inclusive? And, and can we break with historical patterns of exclusion and concentrated ownership? And the, the, the distributed and um, decentralized nature of, of renewable energy provides opportunities to do this. But I, I do think that one could argue that the new renewables sector is replicating old and exclusionary patterns. So if we look at small scale solar, um, for example, this only really benefits rich people that can afford the costs of installations which are um, really high, I think, as most of us have um, unfortunately realized, trying to get away from load shedding. Um, then also we look at the REAP, the you know, independent power producer program. Um, 
And as the rounds have progressed, there is increasing, I think, domination by smaller, by small groups of large companies and banks. And, and design features that, that were intended to expand ownership and participation like community trusts are not working as they should be due to inadequate implementation. And uh, Peter mentioned earlier that we did some work around this a couple of years ago. Um, so this more inclusive vision isn't being re realized. Next slide, please. Um, so what needs financing? So there are two sets of activities and we've called them transitioning out and transitioning in. So the first set of activities, the uh, transitioning out, um, is about ensuring that workers and their families that currently depend on, on, um, on coal um, don't pay a price for the energy transition that the rest of us don't need to pay. And measures to counteract their immediate losses include things like uh, monetary compensation, social protection, early retirement, reskilling, upskilling, and relocation support to areas of new economic activity. So example could be supporting workers in Pumalanga to the Gauteng metro region, if that's what they want. Um, the second set of activities we call transitioning in. Um, and this is about building new inclusive, a new inclusive energy economy. Um, and so this includes energy production infrastructure and, and associated industries like transport, like uh, climate resilient infrastructure, sustainable agriculture and tourism. Um, it's, the, the scope is very broad. And so in the second report, we've tried to understand in more detail um, and what these activities are and what roles the private sector can play in, in financing them. Um, and this figure has been mentioned already today. So there's an estimation from the World Bank that about two, two trillion rand is, is what the funding gap is. Um, and this just isn't going to be enough for, for public spending, which is the, the topic of the next report, or, or for increased taxation to cover on its own. The, the private sector needs to become more involved. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here are some recommendations, and a lot of it's quite similar to what Jana has already said. So for um, institutional investors, private companies, asset managers, there's a lot of innovation market development that's going to be required. Um, so one is to design new um, and bigger investment vehicles. So what we've seen to date in the impact investing universe has been um, rather small one-off investments for example the social impact bonds which we we did a series of reports about so these were decent investments with you know, good financial returns and and social outcomes in relation to youth employment and early child development but um, market development just isn't proceeding. So COVID um, definitely interrupted a lot of plans that were um, underway for new projects, but I think you know, it's time to get back into it. Um, we've got to consolidate lessons from these SIBs and from other impact investments to design bigger vehicles that can achieve scale. Um, and then it's important that the jet, like a jet focus or framework is incorporated into strategic decision-making and operations. So this is a kind of broad business design issue. And then that better reporting about um, jet contributions is, um, is adopted. So this could be achieved by making use of the um, Impact Investment Institute's just transition investment framework that Jana mentioned um, in her presentation, where they've got those three criteria for how an investment can contribute to achieving positive outcomes in terms of climate environmental action, um, improving distributional outcomes and equity and increasing community voice. And that's as opposed to 
looking at treating ES treating jet investments as one would treat an ESG investment in the kind of dominant way that this is currently practiced, where instead we'd look at kind of the risks of um, maldistribution in society and how those affect us from the outside into the company rather than how we as a company or as an institutional investor affect those outcomes externally. Um, and participate in or develop progressive business and investor forums that are committed to the JET. Um, and then for foundations, they also have a role in market development and in providing catalytic capital. So one way for foundations to contribute to achieve to social justice in the transition is to adopt, I mean, like I've already mentioned for other private sector actors to incorporate the JET into foundational mission. So now what, what I've seen, um, my impression is that a lot of foundations kind of think of the JET as being a specialized issue. It's outside of, of our remit of, of health or of education or, or whatever, or employment training or whatever it is. Um, and that kind of flows from the idea of, of JET being about compensation for coal mines, right? But if we take that broader view, then you can see that, that, that JET lens kind of you know, applies to everything. And so any foundation can, so employment training, you can skills train for, for green jobs, for example, um, or in education at school level, you can do similar sorts of things. Um, social welfare, you can provide grants that support um, community renewable energy um, initiatives, for example. Um, another way that foundations can contribute is through their participation in blended finance vehicles. Um, so this is where you provide first loss capital in um, blended structures, which um, reduce the risk profile for more commercial investors. Um, and that can be an important form of market development. And that again is building on um, experience that we already have in South Africa. So this has already been achieved with the social impact bonds. We found local foundations play this role. And then another thing would be, um, it's considered pooled funds. So this isn't something that really happens here, but in Spain, for example, a group of 20 foundations have um, allocated a portion of their grant making capital to a pooled structure that is managed by a central entity. And that fund is used for impact investments for small social enterprises. Um, and the benefit of pooling these funds is scale, firstly. And then secondly, when um, diving into a very new area, impact investing, that most foundations don't know very much about, and it's very different to grant making. Um, pooling funds and expertise is a way to accelerate um, the learning process and to get more funds into impact investment structures. Um, next slide, please. So, got some recommendations for government as well. One of these is to provide clarity on current investment rules for nonprofit organizations. So, uh, the community trusts, for example, that have been established in, in the REAP program um, could, and, and not just them, but also a lot of uh, foundations in the rest of the nonprofit sector would be interested in impact investing and in, de and in developing um, or growing their, their asset bases, but refrain from doing so because the current regulation is unclear and there is a fear of losing um, their the, the tax benefits that come with their public benefit um, status right so there's it's really important that these rules are clarified and there is work underway to try and get that to happen another um, regulatory issue that that needs to be addressed or could be addressed is that the government should look into social entrepreneurship as a separate tax regime so this is something that falls between um, non-profits and, and for-profit companies, somewhere in the middle. So 
it, it, it could be really useful in the context of the transition where you've got lots of small businesses that could be doing important things that generate profits while also doing really important things for the environment and for society. So in countries like um, Vietnam, South Korea, Thailand, the UK, this structure exists and it, it's applicable to things like um, small waste management companies that are looking at innovative ways, um, alternatives rather to, to landfill as a waste management strategy. Um, also, that's more employment intensive. Um, there are you know, uh, ecotourism, um, small construction companies that build green housing and climate resilient infrastructure and that employ young people, for example. All of these sorts of things could benefit from a, um, uh, a, a more a differentiated tax regime. Um, government could also, in the same way as foundations, participate in blended finance vehicles as they've already done in South Africa at, um, at provincial government level, Gauteng and the Western Cape have done this. Um, and combine this kind of carrot, these carrot approaches, de-risking, um, with stronger tax regimes so a more strongly enforced carbon tax regime, for example, and then more rigorous enforcement of existing legislation as well. Because it's all very well to be talking about doing new things with the jet, but we already have legislation, for example, about minimum wages. So make sure that people are complying with that, right, as a baseline. Um, and just a note that I've added at the bottom here is that blended finance needs to be used with caution. So de-risking and providing catalytic capital that brings in, that de-risks investments for commercial actors, senior investors, is useful in, in market development and in contexts like this, where there's very little activity that's happening and we need to develop a, a market for these investments. Um, but too much of it or doing it too long and this can just become an unnecessary subsidy um, for private capital. And that reduces the fiscal space that's available to deal with all of the social challenges um, that the state escalating social challenges that climate change is going to um, confront the state with. And then finally, just for individual investors, um, we all have roles as well. So we need to become more aware of, of where our pensions and other savings are invested. Um, and advocate for, for, for greater transparency in, in relation to um, from our pension funds and saving funds, whatever. Um, greater transparency about how our investments are influencing um, ESG and, and, and JET outcomes. Next slide, please. So we've got an example of of investment here. So I'll just go through this very quickly. So it's MCOPA, it's, it's a company headquarters in Nairobi, and it provides financial and financing and digital services to underbanked and or low-income consumers um, across four markets in East and West Africa. And so it matches payment terms for solar home systems, solar powered devices, and smartphones with customers' um, daily or weekly earning and spending cycles. So the finance that is provided by the platform um, takes the form of pay-as-you-go solutions with low interest rates, um, low non-payment penalties, with the devices that are provided, used as collateral, um, and less frequent repayment uh, rates, which is important in context where there's a lot of precarious employment. Um, and what this is doing is it's expanding access to renewable energy um, and to electrification in, in for a lot of people that otherwise would not be able to afford it. So the company started really small with, with donor funding, eventually attracting impact capital. Um, on commercial terms, so it's, so it's decent market related returns for these investors and uh, currently has around 3 million customers. So the grant funding that was provided initially from 
international foundations has supported research and development, um, development of new product offerings, expansion into new markets, and then also was used as catalyst catalytic capital in a blended structure to bring in these commercial investors. Um, and some of the impact metrics that the company reports on um, include the value of credit unlocked for people that otherwise would not be able to access credit, additional income that's earned through access to new products and to, to electricity that enable economic activity, um, health outcomes, the number of fume-free hours. So like in South African townships um, and rural areas in East and West Africa, there are a lot of people that use dangerous alternatives. So even where you're grid connected, it's not a reliable supply. And so you end up using things like paraffin and candles, which are not good for your health. So that's a, an outcome that they report on, number of fume-free hours. The proportion of female clients, so better electrification, given gender norms across the continent it's if you uh, women are responsible for care and household work and electrification and access to devices reduces the time required for care work frees up their time for other things um and and then there's green outcomes right so the tons of co2 emissions avoided number of energy efficient solar powered devices installed etc so just to end um, just some, a few priority areas I'll just highlight briefly, and there's a lot of detail about these and other areas as well in the report. So the first is, is to just get better at ESG investing for the, the just energy transition. So as Jana has already discussed in a lot of detail, this involves shifting to more additionality and opportunity focused approach rather than kind of internal risk management. Um, and then better reporting um, alongside that. So using things like the Impact Investment Institute's Just Transition Investment Blueprint. Another really promising area is the expansion of community trusts roles. So there are several trusts that we know of that would really like to expand their asset holding beyond just the project company that they that their establishment is associated with, right? So most only earn income from the wind farm or the solar facility that they are attached to. Um, several want to become independent investors in their own right, right? In, in for example, in new uh, procurement rounds um, of the REAP and beyond that as well, right? But, um, and then also to become involved in things like community renewable energy. So one of the really weird things that we found in our research in the REAP program that we did a couple of years ago is that you've got all this renewable infrastructure that's going up, but these communities have kind of declining um, reliability of their electricity supply. And that's got a lot to do with you know, the structure of ESCOM, but that's changing. It's becoming more possible for decentralized production and trust could play a bigger role in doing that. But taking on these more commercial and investment roles um, is difficult due to the regulatory ambiguity. And so that's, that urgently needs to be clarified, but it's not complicated to do that. Um, then market-based products for renewable energy access. So along the lines of the case study that I just talked about. So just making sure that renewable energy is something that penetrates across the whole economy and doesn't just benefit few people. Um, leaving the rest of us to rely on ESCOM. Um, and then finally, pay for performance programs. So South Africa has, I think, there are a few projects, but it's substantial experience in doing them. Um, where you, for, for youth employment, for example, so you attach um, payments to placements into jobs. So it's a, it's a way of motivating for more effective skills training and that's that's more demand based so that it fits with what employers need and so doing this for the green economy i think shows a lot of promise and then in the report we've also talked quite a lot about transition bonds so yana has discussed those and also jet funds which focus on a lot of the social entrepreneurship side of things um so i'll stop there um yeah for our time thank you
Great. Thank you very much, um, Zohib. Um, I think the thing just to really reinforce uh, from Zohib's presentation is the complexity of this and the discussions we have with a lot of asset managers and banks around the social justice issues meant we had to actually wind back a lot to this education point. Uh, you know, and actually really defining very clearly in the report what we meant by the social justice uh, element. Um, and hopefully that is um, uh, of uh, use, I think, more, more broadly than, than you know, just a set of uh, reports for, uh, for the finance industry um, and for those interested in, uh, in, in JET more broadly. Um, but I think the point of, of paper two is this is really hard. I mean, there's a lot of uh, you know, issues that Zoho went into there in, in you know, a limited amount of time, a lot more in the report. Uh, but the social justice issues in particular are uh, are particularly diff difficult and where that graph uh, that Jan showed earlier of the different mix of uh, capital providers really has to come together uh, in ways, again, it does happen at the moment, but in just a way and a scale uh, and a continual, uh, you know, coming together over time uh, that, that doesn't happen at the moment. So it's heartening to see in the, in the Q&A in the chat, you know, there are people who are doing all the projects, people getting funding, people with funding, uh, but we are trying to leapfrog this uh, into uh, in, into scale uh, very much. But uh, thank you for the, this is the presentation. We are going to deal with some of the questions now, I think, or ask some questions. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, and really a big thank you to Peter, Jana, and Zora for the, these presentations. I think there's a, quite a few questions coming out, and even the questions are quite quite big questions. So we'll, we'll spend the last sort of 15 minutes maybe going through some of the questions. Um, and if there are any more, please please put them in the chat. So I'm, I'm going to go based on on where they've been been asked. So so Jan, I'm going to start with you, and it's a question from Sekwetlani, and they ask. So you indicated that a great deal more education needs to happen with asset managers regarding the basics of what a jet entails. Could you elaborate further what these knowledge gaps look like? How this education can and must be done? <clears throat> you mentioned a targeted approach in your presentation, and significant who which stakeholders have the, the legitimacy to be leading this work. Great, thanks, Alan, and thanks for the question. So I think one of the the key challenges is that um, you know the the players in the ecosystem that are expected to finance this, they, they this is like an entirely new type of funding that needs to be done. So they might be used to financing um, only infrastructure projects where it's very clear what the objective is, um, but to include the social justice element as well into that equation is what makes it really, really difficult. And, you know, asset managers are grappling with how, how does taking that additional consideration, that additional element into consideration, how does that um, have an impact on the fiduciary duty as well. Um, can they can they include that in their mandate without um, infringing on their fiduciary duty? Um, so it's really about like wrapping the heads around what like financing for this just energy transition means and the types of products and projects and instruments that can be used to to do the financing. In terms of of who needs to be responsible for that, I think that. Um, there are there are several sort of um, several um, stakeholders that will will have to intervene. So, firstly, the PCC and the the PCFTT, um, who will need to act as one to avoid um, confusion um, around um, who's sort of like in charge. They really need to ramp up the advocacy efforts um, in the wider financial ecosystem in South Africa, and they need support from you know, or they need to channel this through. Um, industry bodies like ASISA, BATSITA, BASA, the market, reg market regulators like the FSCA, the Prudential Authority, and then also to have direct engagement with the systemically important banks, pension funds, and insurers. So um, it's both like a, a broad approach, but also, as we spoke about the targeted approach, actual individual engagement with the systemically important organizations to make sure that they understand what their role is and how they can participate. Thank you so much, Jana. Um, I think I'm going to group two questions, and it, it speaks to to some of the, the the sovereign guarantees and and the risk. So, so one question is is is, and this is to, to Zoheb and, and and Peter as well. Is how do we respond to the concern that sovereign guarantees and as it, and as has been pointed out, um, long term financing models put the state at risk of financing 
the private sector to profit or fail at the expense of public spending on the responses. And similarly, there was another question um, from Matlatsi um, in terms of in financing, how will this drive risk sharing amongst public and private funders with the concern being returns on investment? So maybe, maybe I think on, on, on the guarantees piece, um, Zohar and Peter, if you would like to um, sure. share some thoughts. So, I mean, this is partly why we're writing paper three is these public finance issues come out like guarantees. Um, so you have to wait six weeks to, to see the full answer, but no, the, um, I mean, in general, guarantees are there at the moment to solve for problems, right? And uh, issues in the system, in particular around the fact that the uh, transmission offtaker, in particular, uh, ESCOM is, is not currently a, a going concern, um, you know, without bailouts and without guarantees. Now, you have to solve those underlying problems. Um, you know, and if you don't want any guarantees, you're going to have to wait until those are solved. And guarantees can play a role as they have done the establishment uh, of REAP, but there should not be guarantees in the long term once you solve those problems, like you've spun out NTCSA uh, as an independent entity, uh, for instance. But uh, to, uh, to go back on what I just said, to preview some of what we might say in paper three, you know, the big, big problem we have in Mpumalanga is that the province and the municipalities are of exceptionally poor financial health, right? And this, again, is coming back and links into the second question, actually. Uh, this comes back to the fact of what do you do? Do you wait for these entities to get better in terms of financial health so that they can be banked um, uh, and that they can access uh, capital? Um, do you bring in philanthropies to take that risk um, and in effect backstop and provide guarantees instead of the state? The actual simple answer is no, most, most uh, actually philanthropies and DFIs are not actually willing to, off, uh, to face off against um, uh, off the province or, or municipalities without their own guarantees from Treasury. Um, so you are going to have to have a role. And I think uh, whilst I'm certainly sympathetic to the question around not uh, uh, having the incorrect sort of risk balance that, that guarantees, unfortunately, given in this financial health issue, given the ESCOM health issue, are going to play a role, but we should get rid of them uh, as quickly as possible. And then, Zohib, if you have anything to add on that? Uh, yes. So just in terms of the question about, about blend of finance and the state providing catalytic capital, I think that there has to be like genuine risk in, in the context. So you look at each investment in its own context and then decide, like, is there a real risk of this thing not working that justifies um, the catalytic capital or the guarantee? So I think in if there's an, an actor that's doing something really innovative that aligns with the state's objectives in terms of promoting environmental and social objectives, um, that has not been done before um, and where you, the, the intention is to develop a track record that can then inspire the development of similar investments on a bigger scale, then I think there's, that, that it could be justified, right? That the state subsidizes or de-risks um, investments for, for private actors. And I think in, in the South African context, we can look at examples like as I've mentioned, the, the social impact bonds, where you had investor returns tied to social outcomes, like in a really unique way that hadn't been done before. And to tackle really big social issues that the states really battled with for a long time, right? So improving early learning outcomes for four and five-year-olds and then employment outcomes for, um, for young adults. So I think in those contexts, it's it's warranted. And then once you have um, a market that's in its kind of, uh, that's heading into maturity, and I think that's where the difficulty is. That's where I think it's important to stop providing those sorts of guarantees. So yes, the balance is in figuring out the difficulties and figuring out when the end point is, I suppose. Thanks very much, so and Peter. Um, th there's there's a question I think we talk about returns as well. Um, and Penny Herbs asks, is, can can we define a decent return in the context of a just transition? And is it different to other returns um, in the sector? 
um, acknowledging it's a broad question, um, but recognizing that um, funding might not end up being different from the business as usual approach that we are seeing. Um, Peter, would you like to take that one? Yeah, so thank you, Benny, for the question. Um, a difficult one as usual. Um, it's, we, we had experience this actually during COVID. We were designing potential COVID bonds for uh, the African government uh, and interviewed a lot of people, um, in particular uh, asset managers and other people who would buy this, uh, buy such an instrument. And people are not willing to accept more than uh, a couple of base points below the sovereign curve. The problem, of course, is that the sovereign yield curve uh, is so cheap. Uh, sorry, well, the bond is so cheap, the curve is so steep uh, that, you know, you're still paying up a very large interest rate. You're not going to, and this will, of course, feeds back into the JetP uh, discussions on concessionality. You're not going to be able to fund, and this is very much the premise of our papers, you're not going to be able to fund JET uh, from the private sector at markedly lower, uh, you know, um, uh, interest rates or returns uh, than you can get on the sovereign yield curve. That's not going to happen. Uh, and so, hence, a lot of the recommendations are about working within that uh, framework. So, climate-specific uh, funds still need to make a similar return uh, for whoever is providing their seed capital, whether that's a pension, et cetera, who will ultimately mark their returns. Uh, again, off, off a, a sovereign curve and, and with reference to that, um, uh, or a blend of that and expected returns uh, in terms of the equity market. Um, and the point here is scale. So we, you can find out there, you know, uh, some asset managers who might accept more of a discount versus others. But the scale of financing we're talking here is we're going into those foreign and domestic institution investors. You're not going to be able to shift from that, uh, from that paradigm Fundamentally, so that's what we sort of mean here by uh, by decent return is that uh, is that context. I think that's just a side way. note here would be um, that currently, I think for a lot of these sorts of investments that prioritise environment or social outcomes, um, there is an expectation that the returns are going to be lower, and I think that's partly due to um an incorrect pricing in of, of the risks of these things into the prices of assets and investments and there is a lot of work that's going into changing that to a better accounting of how um the systematic risks of climate change of inequality of potential societal collapse um should be factored into how investments are priced and when that starts happening on a larger scale, I mean, this is being done by people like the TCFD, TIFD, the pre-distribution initiative. I think once that starts to gain traction, then we'll start to see that the, um, that the, the relative prices and returns on, the, on JET and non-JET start to, um, to look very different. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm mindful we have, we have only five minutes left, but I do want to try and get through the questions. Some of the, there's some, some, still some good questions to come. So I'm going to push on a little bit longer and maybe just ask our panelists to try and be as succinct as possible. But I know these are big questions. But there's two questions relating to one, um, carbon taxes and the recommendation around carbon taxes. Um, and there's a second question that moves out of, out of energy, but speaks to the debt for adaptation swaps or debt for climate swaps. And, and maybe I'll just ask some of the, the panelists to reflect on, on these two, two mechanisms as a, as a, as a contributor to, to raising those finances that, that are needed. Yeah, so, I mean, these are not generally applicable at, at scale, in particular for South Africa. So I, investors are willing and open to think about these where there are particularly uh, adaptation issues, where there are uh, resilience issues, uh, and countries, particularly in the case of smaller states uh, that are uh, exposed to climate change risk, uh, where that impact would uh, impact uh, sovereign uh, debt sustainability uh, or solvency uh, of the sovereign. So they do certainly have a use uh, and uh, very you know, large uh, you know, vanilla uh, institutional investors are willing to consider them, um, but they are not a, a general uh, generally applicable, I think, tool, um, particularly where there are not uh, cases of where uh, 
uh, climate impact would impact um, sovereign uh, sustainability, and such as in the case of South Africa, uh, there is no, uh, I think, evidence yet that that would be the case. Uh, or indeed, it must also be said in terms of middle income countries uh, as well. I think a lot of these tools are much more applicable to lower income countries where you naturally have uh, more, uh, more issues around uh, solvency and debt sustainability uh, as well. So no, we, 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 we are not against those sorts of instruments. Right? We just do not think they're applicable uh, in, the, uh, in the case of South Africa. You're on mute, Alan. Sorry, I'm on mute there. I'm just going to put another question on, on community trusts. And there's a question, uh, maybe that speaks to, to your presentations or even in terms of some of the specific issues hindering the growth of community trusts um, and, and the regulatory blockages in that space. And I think that it's, it's critical, right? Saying is that you've got a, a well-intended initiative, but if it's not delivering the results, maybe a, a bit more elaboration on, on that in, in two minutes, but also a big question. So let's see what you can do. And this is a hard stop in four minutes. So I have a short answer is just to read our report on the REAP Community Trust. The two big issues are financing of the trust. So they're financed by debt at really kind of extraordinary rates provided by our local DFIs. Um, so this catches uh, or keeps the trust in these debt cycles that last a really long time. So no work is getting done. Another issue is just in terms of um, capacity development. And there are very few trusts that have the right kind of trustees with the skills and experience to do real kind of community development work. Um, and I mean, when I talk about the ones that are interested in becoming engaged financial actors themselves, that's a very small minority, but it could be a much larger group that start to do that. So, yeah. Thanks so much. And I'm going to, to begin wrapping up, but, but I really, I think, want to, to encourage all participants. There's some really great questions. And I think both IntelliDix and the African Climate Foundation are, are actually working on these issues. And these are big questions to solve, but it's now about going into each of these specific areas and, and digging a little deeper in terms of what's needed to, to drive some of the recommendations or to realize those recommendations. So it's, it's an ongoing piece of work. But please, I, I'm, I'm sure I speak on behalf of Intensix uh, as well, that, that there are questions or, or further discussions on the, on the reports. A third report is, is coming out um, in the coming months and, and this work is evolving and we'll be getting more granular um, as, as this work unfolds. But maybe Peter or Jana or Zove, any, any final closing remarks from, from your end um, before we close the, the webinar? No, just to thank everyone very much for, for joining. Um, please go and read the four reports. There's a lot more in there that we couldn't cover. Um, and more to come in our third report on some of those public finance related issues. But I would just stress this is very much a point of departure. You know, there are a lot of problems to solve here uh, and move into uh, implementation. Uh, and I think, you know, we're very excited working with banks and asset managers and people at that end of the spectrum. Uh, and you know, many people on the call on the project uh, end of the spectrum uh, as well. And hopefully we will all meet uh, in the middle. Thanks very much. Zohar, Yana? No, just to say thanks very much to everyone and to, to ACF um, for getting us together. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, also from my side, I think this is a really, really interesting and exciting topic and look forward on look forward to taking this work that we've started forward and hopefully resolving some of these very knotty issues that we are um, grappling with. Fantastic. So everyone watch the space. We are ending at three on the dot and we look forward to engaging further with everyone. Thank you very much.